Welcome to the next installment of our Learn from the Expert series, where today I'm talking with Joachim Arvidsson. Joachim and I have known each other for a while. He has been on the platform for a really long time. He's a really active contributor on the forums and just has a lot of wisdom and knowledge that he acquired over the years and is going to share that with us today. Uh, he also has won uh, the very challenging competitive insiders challenge. So it will be really interesting to see what his workflow is and how he was able to produce a factor that uh, was able to persist over the two year holdup period. So Joachim, thanks so much for coming on the series. No, no problem, you're welcome. Um, I'd like to just hear uh, about your background, like what did you study? Do you come more from a software or economics angle and what got you motivated to try Quantoken? Yeah, I, um, I've always been in, uh, interested in investing since very early age, and um, I studied finance in school uh, in the U.S. I'm Swedish originally, um, but um, yes, yeah, so I went into finance. I worked for uh, an investment bank in uh, Tokyo for about uh, ten plus years, and then wow. um, another four years in uh, in Sydney. Um, so I'm more from a finance and, and risk background. What did you? Uh, what kind of stuff did you work on in, in Japan and then later in Australia? I started off in uh, um, information security or cyber security, um, and then moved into um, um, uh, infrastructure uh, type of IT roles, um, including um, disaster recovery uh, coordination and. Um, um, the last role I had at uh, Credit Suisse was um, uh, as a service delivery for the, the uh, futures desk. So sitting on the trading floor and, and uh, just kind of uh, problem solving and, and uh, project management for um, uh, you know delivering services to the futures desk. So that was uh, was a good experience and, and uh, a lot of stress, but you know a lot of uh, learning experiences as well. I can imagine, yeah, that's some really hands-on experience. Uh, yeah. So, um, so how long have you been on the platform, and how did you find out about it? I think I've been on the platform for uh, just over two years now, um, and it was actually my um, my old boss uh, in Sydney, who's uh, he was a regional uh, risk manager uh, at ABN Amro, um, who. Um, we were we were talking, you know, in the team about you know how our clients uh, are, you know, coming up with the quantitative uh, algorithmic trading strategies, and uh, um, he recommended you know having a look at uh, Quantopian. Um, at that time, I I didn't really know any Python or, or wasn't very good at programming, <laughs> um, so I think I I didn't uh, spend much time on Quantopian right away, but. Um, uh, eventually, I, I uh, was very intrigued and uh, started to learn, uh, you know, Python and, and the platform. And uh, yeah, so. And um, how did you learn Python? Like, were the materials on the platform helpful for that, or any other oh, resources sure, yeah. that you can share? Um, I think you know my motivation was basically to learn Python in order so I could could uh, create strategies that I wanted to create. Because um, I had a lot of ideas, but uh, um, if you don't know Python or, or uh, um, you know the the kind of the platform and and how it all works, um, then it's very difficult. So um, I took I think uh, most of the lessons that you guys have online on Quantopian. I also took a few um, online courses on on Python and uh, NumPy and, and Pandas. And uh, um, so yeah, I. I um, Still feel like I, I uh, have a lot to, to learn <laughs> in, uh, in in that in those areas, but uh, yeah, I'm a lot better these days. Okay, so it sounds like you're definitely coming more from an economics finance background. Yep. Is that how you would describe your edge in terms of coming up with new strategies? And then it's mainly yeah. the barrier is in terms of implementing it. Yes, absolutely, uh, spot on. Um, I'm also, you know, like I mentioned, I, I've been interested in investing all my life. You know, I started investing when I was uh, 13 um, and just, you know, following the market uh, ever since. Um, you know, one of my uh, kind of uh, 
um, heroes in, in investing is uh, Warren Buffett. And, uh, you know, I've, I've you know, read so many books, uh, you know, about him and, and you know, how he um, invests um, and, um, you know, his his letters to shareholders. Uh, we actually went to, um, my partner and I went to the Berkshire Hath Hathaway meeting, uh, annual meeting, uh, um, what, three years ago now. Uh, all the way from Sydney to uh, Omaha, Nebraska. So that was a wow. <laughs> kind of a bucket list for me. Uh, but yeah, that's um, how big of a fan I am. But <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. Um, so then, how would you describe your process in coming up with ideas for new trading strategies and how to then, uh, yeah, go about seeing if they if they pan out? But yeah, what is the origin of your ideas usually? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, when I first started, I did a lot of back tests and uh, that was a good way to learn um, Python and, and uh, you know, the platform, how things work. You know, if I just tweak this thing here, what happens, you know, and so um, that was that was a good way to learn uh, how basically how the trading strategy, you know, the the, the structure works. Um, but uh, today, I spend most of the time in research um, just because it's faster. Uh, and I've also learned that, you know, if you run a lot of back tests and uh, just kind of pick out the one that uh, looks best or has the highest chart ratio, then, you know, that's a, a kind of a foolproof way of overfitting. Um, so I think that's one main thing I wanted to talk to, to you about today was, uh, you know, how to avoid uh, fooling yourself or, or overfitting uh, as much as possible anyway uh, or what I what I what I try to do anyway. yeah uh, I mean that is probably one of the most important things to put out there so I think that's right on the on the mark and it also seems like a very natural progression of users coming to the platform then first learning Python or whatever other skill set they need in order to get started then diving into the back tester, learning some hard lessons hopefully about overfitting and yeah. then switching more to research and that is really interesting it's like all the experts we talked to in these videos they all mentioned how important the research environment is so yeah um so yeah i think then it'd be really interesting to see your more of your process and, and the type of materials yeah. that you that you have so i haven't really put um, too much comments on, on this maybe i can add that on later on but uh um i've actually you know taken a lot of the code or almost all of the code from your uh, notebook which is called um uh, cross validation over um, odd even quarters i think um which i think is a, a great notebook we can link to it in in the post maybe but um, um basically the idea there is to train um over you know a certain time period uh, but not train on the whole time uh, period, just train on, um, you know, the the odd quarters uh, and then uh, basically validate your your uh, factor or your model on the, the even quarters uh, during the training period. So that's kind of the idea of this uh, uh, research process. And this is what I used for the um, insiders. Uh, um, challenge um uh strategy it's great so we'll just import these uh i i normally tend to set the my uh, winsorize parameters here at the top as well so at least uh, at least one percent on each side but uh, two percent here i've done and then the start period period of the training uh is 2010 i've set and, and uh, 2017 that's that's a decent, uh, decently long period, I think. And uh, so, um, uh, but it also leaves us a little bit of time, uh, both after uh, as well as before, to test uh, our final model uh, in on out of sample data. So yeah, I tend to set the the wins rise uh, parameters here at the top uh, or at the top of the strategy. Uh, and I, I tend to just wins the rise by uh, at least one percent on uh, on each side. Um, just to clean out any extra large values. Yes, exactly. So to to 
minimize the impact of uh, any outliers in the distribution. Um, and I've set the start uh, period to be uh, Jan uh, 2010 uh, up until 2017. So this will leave us uh, a little bit of time after uh, the, the training period to test our model uh, on out of sample, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, I'll show you later on um, as well. So that's really cool. So you not only are doing the cross validation and splitting even in odd quarters, you also leave a third thing out, um, like it's common in machine learning, right? Where you have the yeah. train and then the validation, and then you have the test set, which you only touch at the very, very end. Yeah, exactly. So cool. And it's uh, the key here is I think to be kind of diligent and and uh, you know not not peak on the validation or test. Uh, and then start tweaking your your uh, factor. You know, once you're done, then you're done. You either accept it or or reject the the factor. That that must be hard to reject it, right? When you it work is. on it for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, if I'm if I'm done with a a factor and and it doesn't um, hold up, you know, um, yeah, that that is <laughs> difficult. But you know, it's also you know it's it's a short way of of uh, you know pretty much guaranteeing overfitting, I think. So um, I'm better off just kind of having a, a different uh, hypothesis or, or working on a different data set or, or at least different data points. Absolutely. Um, so this uh, custom factor here is just kind of a very simple, I wanted to show also what I tend to do when I uh, combine factors is to fill uh, a, a factor after I've z-scored it uh, with zeros. Uh, just because if I combine factors uh, and there, there's a lot of nons in there, um, you lose a lot of information. So um, um, that's basically what this this uh, custom factor does. And uh, so if you want to look up what uh, NumPy non to num does, you know, I can show that. Uh, I think do a Google search and. Uh, it replaces nouns with zeros by default. You can change this, um, and also uh, replaces uh, inf infinite values, positive or negative, with uh, instead of a, a, a large number. So if if you divide by zero, for example, and get a large or well infinite uh, positive inf infinity or, or negative infinity, then uh, that's not very useful either. Um, so interesting. Yeah, I didn't even know about this function. That's cool. Yeah. And then I just define the universe. I tend to use uh, Q tradable stocks, the full universe. Um, and like other people have shown, I also tend to uh, group by sectors. Um, so these are kind of the different granul granularity uh, that you can use in terms of sectors or industries. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the factors that I'm using today, uh, they're not, I think uh, the first one is basically uh, the same one that Vedran uh, used. I just wanted to kind of show the process today, not, not necessarily uh, what, what are good factors, but uh, basically they're, they're uh, estimate based. So earnings per share for the next quarter and uh, also price target. Um, so first I define the first factor. So it's just the number of, uh, uh, up uh, consensus uh, estimates uh, for the next quarter, uh, minus the, the down ones, and then once rise by uh, our parameters. Um, now this, if either of these have uh, missing data or nons, then that stock will have a, a non value in it. So I'll show that as well. So that's why I pass this you know, non filled uh, into this, uh, the, the, pre the custom factor up here. Yeah, I see. And uh, like I mentioned, I, I, I z scored first because uh, I'm filling it with zero. So you want to fill the the nouns with a kind of a neutral value. So you, you have the mean uh, at zero. Um, so uh, you don't want to uh, kind of add <laughs> information to the to the distribution. Right. So let me just show this quickly. 
Um, running the pipeline for one year. And, and this is again, veterans code. So I'm just kind of showing that the first factor that where I haven't didn't do it, it was just raw. Uh, there's a bit of non values, uh, about 2%. Uh, but whereas this one where I'd filled the nonce with the zero, there's there are no nonce. So is there any reason you're doing that versus dropping the values? Yeah, so uh, if you only have one factor, I think it's okay to to drop the nonce. Uh, but if you do combine factors, uh, you know, if one factor has a non for, for a certain stock and, and uh, another factor has a, a true value for it, uh, then, you know, non plus a value equals non. So you, you lose you lose information that way, basically. Right. Yeah. And I remember actually that was one of the challenges for the guidance challenge. Um, yeah. Because there were um, just a few fields and a lot of NANDs for most of the companies. So then if yeah. you have multiple guidance factors, you want to combine them. The intersection, if you drop NANDs, will be very small. And yeah. I actually remember that your factor was by far the one with most stocks uh, in, in the universe. So that's how you were able to achieve that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and you can do this, um, you know, outside of pipeline as well. Uh, the, the filling of, of nouns, uh, but I tend to do it inside of, of the pipeline with the with a custom factor like that. But if you want to do it outside of the uh, of pipeline, you can just kind of uh, do um, uh, fill na uh, with zero uh, inside the the function, um, and I, yeah, I can show that later on as well. Um, so. Here, I'm just, for now, I'm just kind of testing uh, this factor. So, but later on, this is where I also combine the factor. So I just add them together once after they've been z-scored. Um, here, this is basically how, if I need to smooth the, the combined factor, uh, the final factor, that's how I would do it. But I'm just comment comment that out for now. Um, cool. So. Let's just run. This won't take too long, I think. Um, yeah. So this this is how you could also fill it uh, after you run the pipeline on, on the data frame. Uh, I don't actually think we have any nouns here, so this is kind of we don't need this. But <laughs> um, if you wanted to do it outside of pipeline, you can just kind of export all the factors and then. Uh, add them together after you've filled them uh, outside of the pipeline. Right. And here's, uh, so this is basically your code. You're splitting the quarters into uh, odd and even and, and train and test. Uh, and that's dividing up the data and getting the uh, prices for the data. Uh, and then for the train uh, quarters, so uh, which are the odd quarters, I think, um i am just i'm taking you know i'm looking for day one five days uh, into the future 10 days and uh, one month one trading month um i tend to focus mostly on um one day uh, because i worry about kind of data overlapping issues and, and po possibly uh, data leakage uh, so i tend to mostly focus on on uh, one day into the future um, and i know that kyle had created the kind of a nice summary uh, table of of uh, the key factor statistics from alpha lens which is great but uh, uh, i tend to use when i train train the factor i tend to use just this uh, uh, summary chart sheet uh, which has uh, the information that I that I uh, I use when I train the factor, um, and then I, I normally just look at uh, the IC mean, which I want to be as as high as possible. It's uh, still a bit low, but uh, you know at least it's not too um, varied. Uh, so standard deviation is is uh, decent. Uh, you want this to be as low as possible and this to be as high as possible. This is basically the mean divided by a standard deviation of IC. Um, 
and then I see if the factor is statistically significant or not. Um, and I used to look at the p-values mostly uh, and wanting to have the p-value to be below 0 0.05 at least, uh, ideally below 0 0.01. Uh, and I think this t-stat equivalent is uh, above 2 for 0 0.05 p-value and above 3 for 0, for 0 0.01. Uh, so I, I tend to more look at t-values uh, or t-stats uh, uh, these days. And uh, lastly, I look a little bit on the turnover of the of the quantiles as well. I don't want uh, turnover to be too high, so here it's it's, it's not too bad, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, autocorrelation. You always going to have a fairly high autocorrelation, I think, for uh, low turnover factors. Uh, so that's uh, just kind of how it is, I think. Um, and then, yeah, this uh, the first uh, quantile. You want to be as uh, low as possible, <laughs> and you, you want to kind of this uh, ideally a nicer uh, distribution than, than what this is. But this is not too bad. So yeah, looks pretty so good. This, once I have this, then that's kind of my baseline. Uh, now I can, you know, what I tend to do is just kind of copy this and then add a few lines and then paste it there and then go up and tweak the factor to see if I can improve uh, some of those uh, uh, statistics or or if it wasn't, uh, you know, as that's nice to, to start with, you know, I, I would try something else basically. Um, and, and then I would just kind of compare it to, to what, what my baseline was. Um, and yeah. And so kind of with, yeah, go ahead. And, yeah. And interestingly, uh, just to remind everyone, so this is only on the, uh, odd the or even quarters. I forgot what it was. So being optimizing yeah. on this set is totally fine because we yeah. still have the other one to to see if it, yeah. if it actually if yeah, overfit or not. So I wouldn't do this if I had uh, it looked at the, the the test quarters or validation quarters. But uh, uh, since I'm only training the factor now uh, and I still have you know the the other quarters, uh, uh, I think that's fine. Um, but I also want to be mindful that I, I don't want to tweak too much. I don't want to have too many uh, parameters. Uh, 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 basically, so because you know that's that's uh, kind of a, a, a sure way of of uh, overfitting as well. So uh, I want to be mindful that uh, you know have have kind of a general general uh, factor that can generalize on on uh, future data. Yeah, that's a really good point, and one that Lopez de Prado often makes is the number of trials really matters. So everything you try and evaluate is costly and um, just. Yeah basically takes you further into overfitting territory. And even if you have a way of understand and seeing that, right? So if you were to move to the validation or test and seeing like, oh, now it's just overfit. Well, yeah. in that case, you still wasted time, right? Because you yeah. overfit something rather than trying something else, which actually could have worked. Yeah, 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 exactly. I think he mentioned, uh... That if you run 500 back tests, you know the expected highest sharp ratio is uh, either two or three. I can't remember, but <laughs> yes, yeah, you know, very high. Yeah, very high. <laughs> that doesn't mean that it's you're going to get that on future data, though. You know. Yes, exactly. So once I'm done training the factor, now I can you know uh, run it on the, on the held out validation, uh, quarters. So the, the test, uh, that, that we had saved earlier. Um, and I think I've already run this. So, cause this will take some time. Um, and this time I tend to run the full tear sheet, uh, just because it uh, provides a little bit more information. Um, and for this one, you know, Provided you know I hadn't trained on on on, on these quarters, uh, it seems to hold up uh, fairly well. Yeah. Uh, so, but that's you know, that's kind of the assumption going into that that we haven't actually looked at this data 
uh, with this data set or with this, you know, uh, hypothesis that we have uh, in mind, at least not these uh, data points that we're working with. Right, yeah, in this specific example, uh, we sort of already invalidated the out of sample because veteran came up with it and we don't yeah. know the, the specific yeah. process that he used, but nonetheless, it's yeah. very uh, instructive. Yeah, it's uh, I'm more focusing on the process here that rather than uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I think, you know, if I were to come up with a, a good factor that did hold up on, on uh, uh, um, uh, the validation course, you know, I, I wouldn't be showing it. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> But um, yeah, so basically that's it. Um, now, assuming it does hold up, um, you know, I, I, I accept this factor. Uh, if it didn't, uh, let's say that the, the p-value was too high or, or you know, uh, it wasn't statistically significant on, on the, the held out quarters, uh, or, you know, it wasn't predictive on the held out quarters, and then I would need to reject it basically and, and, and try something something else so you would completely discard it at that point yeah yeah these for, for these specific data points yeah that's great oh, combination so yeah that's basically it and I, I i had one more factor here that which is kind of similar it's just the price target up and down divided by the total uh, uh, number of, of price target uh, estimates um and doing the same thing, uh, filling the nouns, and uh, yeah, I won't I won't run that. But uh, basically, that's those are the two factors that I'm I'm running uh, uh, in the back test. Uh, so Great. Just, and do you also have the evaluation on the um, on the future data then? So that would be the next yes. step, right? Yep. So I just. On this over here. So this is the moving into the IDE. So this is kind of the last step, you know, instead of uh, running, you know, hundreds of back tests, you know, I can just kind of run uh, maybe a couple. Um, and uh, it's the same code from from research, you know, just uh, importing all the data and, and the, the modules that we need. Uh, in, initialize, you know, we're trying to um, simulate end of day uh, uh, positions so uh, with also no trading costs uh, so that's why i've set this to to zero um, and uh, yeah rebalancing uh, an hour and 30 minutes before the close and uh, yeah that's it why is it not showing everything oh there okay And so that's mostly just copy pasted and yeah, adjusted for our, the back yeah, tester. It's, it's everything from from the research uh, environment and uh, and now you also yeah, include the second factor actually. Sorry. And yeah, now you also include the, the second factor. Yes, correct. So I have uh, two factors in there, and then I group by by sector just to because I don't want to have uh, any tilts uh, in, in sectors. Maybe for for this type of factor, it's not as big of a problem as you know, for example. A, balance sheet uh, type factor uh, where you, you do want to kind of compare uh, to 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 the company's peers uh, apples to apples right and uh, yeah I think that's it you know this is how I would do it if I were to combine it outside of pipeline uh, and fill fill nouns outside of pipeline but you know we're not doing that here Mm -hmm. And I'm not using the risk um, uh, constraints for this one, but I think uh, for this back test, it had, does have a little bit of uh, momentum uh, exposure. So if I wanted to submit this one to the contest, for example, I would need to to apply the the default uh, uh, risk loadings. I see. Okay, but for the challenge, that's not. Problem. Yeah, no, for the challenge, I wouldn't use this. So, cool. Okay, so I think I've run this one already. Oh, sorry, uh, one more thing. <laughs> sure. Um, so, here, you notice that I started the, the actually, it's the wrong one. It should be, I started the back this uh, 2010 when we started the, the um, 
the training, uh, mm -hmm. but then I go over by two years. Uh, so we have, we, we run the back test basically on uh, out of sample data as well. Uh, and that, that will be useful when we run the, the PyFolio uh, tear sheet to evaluate the factor on, on out of sample data. And worst case, we also do have a little bit of time before uh, as well, if we would need to, but uh, uh, hopefully we don't. So let's have a look at this one. Let's wait for it to load. So basically the training period was from 2010 from here up until 2017. I don't know if you can see the mouse there, but- uh, Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, so anything beyond 2017 uh, would be out of sample data, you know, assuming that you hadn't actually looked at this, uh, this factor. Yeah. Um, right. The suspense is building. <laughs> the moment of truth. Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah, this takes a while. So. <laughs> We'll cue some music. <laughs> so yeah, again, the factors, I wouldn't pay too much attention to them. You know, the, the one the veteran made is, might be a good one, but uh, I, I didn't actually put too much uh, thought into the factor. So uh, um, yeah, it was it's more about the process that I wanted to show today. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So already it looks like it's doing pretty well, even the, the holdout. Even on uh, auto sample, yeah. So um, yeah. It meets most of the constraints, uh, and uh, what I tend to do in the back test is to look at the performance here for to see if the sharp is kind of stable. Mm. Um, I mean, one point two sharp, I'd be very happy with if it was on live data. Um, in a back test, you know, I, I tend to be more skeptical. Um, yeah. And uh, for this type of strategy as well, for a long, short, you know, market neutral, risk neutral strategy, you know, you want to see most, mostly specific returns. So you want this to be almost all of this. Um, and ideally, you know, the, the drawdown is not too much and volatility as low as possible. And since we group by sectors, uh, there's no specific sector tilts. As you can see, uh, momentum though is a problem. It's a, it is kind of a growth type of uh, factor. Uh, so that's the only one that uh, didn't meet the requirement for the, the contest. Just barely though, so. Yeah, just barely, so it's not too bad. Yeah, even if you were to apply the optimizer, now you know that um, it would just, in only in very few times would it actually really yeah adjust the weights and then also do so just very lightly. So it, it probably won't be really changing the weights all that much. Yeah, I think the default value is 36% at the top and negative 36 on the, on the bottom. So it wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't impact the strategy much. Turnover is good. I think it's a low turnover strategy. Uh, it's market neutral. Uh, I, I think also since we uh, filled the nuns, we tend to score most of the stocks in the in the QTU, which is good as well. That tends to uh, increase the sharp as well. And uh, yeah, that's basically what I look at in the back test. You know, if we have a look in <coughs> PyFolio, I normally actually these days I don't really let run uh, PyFolio too much anymore. Uh, but it was mm -hmm. a good good tool uh, to kind of learn what to, what, what to look for um, and uh, yeah, to see what's available. Uh, and especially with the live start date here that I've set to uh, the end of the training period. Um, so yeah, that's really cool. 
So I've also uh, specified round trips equal true. Um, that will give us a little bit more information on how uh, accurate the, the model is to predict a, a winning trade. Uh, and high positions, I tend to set as true as well. I'm just hoping that uh, it uses a little bit of less memory and uh, maybe is a little bit faster and hopefully more difficult to uh, reverse engineer if I were to post a tear sheet on the, on the forum. But um, yeah, so now since we did define the live start date, uh, we do Pyfolio breaks it up into in sample and out of sample, which is can be useful. Um, especially when we're trying to determine if you know we have a overfit or underfit or or you know perfectly fit <laughs> model. Um, now, in this case, again, take this with a bit of grain of salt because this looks pretty good, I think, out of sample. Um, but it's possible that I I have already trained on on you know this time series. So, um, uh, but this is you know the the process that we're, I would go through. I would compare. The in sample results, you know, the sharp ratio basically. Uh, hopefully, out of sample is not too far away from the in sample one. Um, same with these other uh, metrics. And uh, yeah, this is the um, round trips equal true um, table. So, percent profitable uh, overall. Uh, basically, you'd want this to be above 50% uh, uh, because 50% is just a coin flip. Um, and, you know, 53% is pretty good if it was on live data and, and true out of sample. Um, but I am a bit skeptical. Um, uh, you know, if we had a 53% edge in a casino, you wouldn't... Uh, uh, Put all your money on one table you would kind of spread it around so that's why we we score uh and, and place a lot of bets on on uh, all the stocks in the universe yeah. i mean that's yeah. basically what the casino is doing right yeah <laughs> the house yeah exactly yeah um the shorts i'm i'm losing a little bit on on the trades i'm not too concerned about that because basically this uh period here that we've uh tested is uh one of the strongest bull markets in in you know, in history. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, for this model, I'm, I'm not looking to make money on the shorts. I'm, I'm looking to make money off the spread between my, my longs and, and short positions. So, yeah. so I'm not too concerned about that. Um, but yeah, the, these figures here can be interesting to look at, you know, just to analyze, to, to, to see how, how profitable the, the model is. Uh, average holding period, I think, is also fairly useful. You know, I, I don't want, I, I tend to not want to, to uh, high turnover uh, strategy. So holding uh, on average uh, positions for, for 30 days or 40 days is, is uh, it's okay, I think. Um, you don't want to be too passive either because you want to actually um, you know, be active actively trading as well uh, but um, yeah so I think that's a decent balance and then we can just scroll down to the bottom one second I don't you look at this stuff in the middle here really but uh, and I don't know yeah. what you feel about either <laughs> yeah I, th I thought we took it out actually but apparently not Okay. Um, so here, I tend to use, look at the specific sharp ratio, which is basically anything that can't be explained by, uh, you know, known uh, factors like the form of French factors uh, or, or beta or, or, or sector tilts. Um, so that's not too bad. You know, if, 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 again, this was on live data, you know, I'd be very happy with a 1.3 sharp ratio. Um, but you know, this is uh, still a back test. So, and this graph here is kind of interesting. I think now that we specified the live start date uh, from 2017, uh, it creates this uh, Bayesian cone here, uh, which is based on uh, on the prior uh, 
data set that we have here or data points uh, and infers what the model you know should stay within you know these bounds in order to uh, you know, if it does, then then it's less likely to be to be overfit, basically. So, here in this case, it stays right kind of in the middle. So that's that's a good sign. You know, if it were to deviate too far off from from this cone here, then then you know, I'd be that'd be a red flag, uh, basically. And again, this is why it's so important to have um, held out data uh, that you can test. You know, at a sample. Uh, and, and you know, time, uh, time series that you haven't actually used to train uh, the model and the factors on. Now, yeah, some people might great. say, "Well, hang on, the spy here is doing a lot better than my model here, so why shouldn't I just invest in the spy here?" But then, also, if we look at the, kind of the volatility, it's it's a lot uh, less volatile than the spy. So I think you know one one point with the long short strategies is that uh, um, you know you combine them first of all into to uh, kind of a meta meta model and and uh, you also apply leverage uh, so that's kind of what this graph here shows where uh, the, the volatility has been matched with uh, with the benchmark which is the spy so here it's more of an apples to apples uh, comparison where um, um, it, it performs a little bit better than the spy, but it's nothing uh, spectacular, really. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, probably if you were to run it a little bit longer, maybe it would have a bigger edge over the spy. Uh, I don't know if things like a pandemic were to occur. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Because it does compound as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, this is just the rolling beta uh, chart. So you can see that it's market neutral, stays around zero. Uh, volatility is very low, around three or so, I think, or two even, uh, versus the spy is quite high. Yeah. Rolling sharp is useful as well. What, what I tend to look at is, you know, that I don't have too many, or not not a downward trend in the sharp, you know, that, that would be kind of a, a red flag and possibly, uh, indicate that the you know alpha has been discovered and of course you don't want too many drawdown periods here that's kind of a long time <laughs> to be out of the money yeah well i mean that's just that's just the way it goes right yeah, even for yeah, like a great factor yeah, drawdown so sorry. Yeah. and uh, yeah i think i mean this one you want to be as green as possible, obviously, you know, the monthly returns. Um, but some months you're going to have uh, down months, uh, even down years uh, sometimes. So if, uh, if we had started this strategy in 2016 and had a down year, you know, maybe we wouldn't be likely to to uh, trade it live in 2017. But then, you know, we still had a <laughs> A big year on 2017, so it's it's uh, it's it's difficult uh, to judge these things. I think it does, yeah. Um, and these uh, red dots here are are the out of sample data uh, on the box plot, so it's it kind of stays on the same distribution. I think. Yeah, that looks that looks great. And yeah, here. I'm scoring most of the stocks in the in the QTU, uh, not quite all of them, I think, but to, uh, the estimates for them, you know. Turnover is fairly low and stable, you know, you have these uh, peaks where um, probably, you know, companies are reporting earnings or, or uh, you know, as, uh, analysts are updating their, their uh, estimates. Uh, rebalancing, yeah, I actually think you could rebalance a little bit closer to the close, just because the close is so high in terms of volume. Uh, but uh, just to be safe, I, I, I uh, rebalanced uh, an hour and 30 minutes before the close. Right. And uh, yeah, this shows the distribution of profitable uh, uh, 
decision uh, or, or likelihood of, of making a profitable trade. And yeah, I think that's about it for Pifolio. We move on to your chart sheet, which is what I tend to use more these days. Basically just insert the backtest ID up here. <laughs> and for this one, I use the, the third party, uh, which has the uniqueness score as well, which is kind of, I found interesting. Um, so I tend to look at this graph here first to see how, you know, the alpha decays with time. Here's a kind of a big drop off on, on day one. Uh, if it had been more of a kind of choppy um, drop off, then I would potentially look at smoothing the factor, the final factor. Or if you had, instead of a decline, you had like an increase uh, in alpha here, then then it might be a good idea to, uh, to smooth the factor again. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, mostly specific uh, um, IR, which is what you look for. Um, and you can see the tilts here again on momentum, uh, no sector tilts because we did group by sectors. Uh, and it does have these spikes here, so that could be another reason to uh, to smooth the factor. And uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's basically my research process. Uh, um, I try to not fool myself <laughs> uh, right. because it is tempting to run a lot of back tests and and be able to show a, a very nice back test with a high sharp ratio and and what have you. <laughs> but you know, the point is not to to back test well, it's the point is to uh, yeah, be able to predict future uh, stock uh, returns uh, well. Uh, and those two are not necessarily correlated. Uh, yeah, often often they're not. Yeah. Um. So, any closing summarizing thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, I try to uh think of ways where i might be fooling myself and where i might you know where overfitting might have crept in um so i i try to hold out uh, a lot of data uh, when i when i uh, develop my models and, and factors uh just because i do want to test them on on, on uh, out of sample data to see if, if they actually hold up and and uh, are able to predict on uh, out of sample data because you know again predicting future stock uh, returns is, is is kind of the whole point of doing this you know not to not to back test well um, and uh, yeah it, it is tempting to to run a lot of back tests you know and uh, I've, I've run my fair share of back tests i think uh, almost twenty seven thousand now i think in these last two years and wow. it's probably at least twenty six thousand too many you know so uh uh, but you know, a lot of that was uh, you know just kind of learning, learning experience, and and uh, becoming aware of of uh, you know the, these pitfalls of how how easy it is to 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 fool yourself and and to to overfit uh, uh, your factors. It's a really critical lesson. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing your workflow with us. Yeah, no worries. You're welcome. Take care. Bye, Jakob. Thank you. Bye.